just how um, the classes that we created throughout this course would hook to a GUI because prior to this point in the class we've been using sort of a test, uh, a unit test module and we essentially hard coded everything. So to test different test cases we went and we tested um, with test cases that essentially we hard coded in. But again, few applications are really going to work that way. Most of them are going to have some sort of GUI associated with them. So um, I had thought about and, and um, I decided it would be better if I, I actually went and completed the GUI over the weekend. Or, or I won't say complete. I got, I got it working. Um, there are probably a few little things that I would address if I was doing this for real. But um, I got enough of it going to show what I wanted to demonstrate. So I won't be building it here in front of you. We'll just be talking about the finished product. Uh, I think that's a better approach uh, to take because I'm not sure how long it would have taken me. I don't know how long it took me. I didn't really time myself when I was doing other things. Uh, but to do it as I was talking about it, it probably would have taken longer than the class today. So I'm glad I went ahead and, and did it. <coughs> so here's what we have in there. and compile it just for good measure. Um, and then I'll run it. So what we have is this. I have a box for you to enter the name in. I thought there was a, 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 a label there, but I guess not. But a box for you to put the name in, and whether it's for delivery or pickup. So I put the name in. I then click Start or Order. And then I get the ability to add um, different pizzas. I can check whether it's a cheap pizza or regular pizza, whether there's pepperoni or not. And then thick, thin, small, medium, or large. Uh, this, this uh, again, um, were I doing this for real, I would make a greater effort to make things look good. All right. Um, but again, I, I wanted to focus on the functionality of it more so than the appearance of the GUI. All right, so I go and click Add Order. It will tell me that a small, thick crust, um, $8, 16 minutes is the total time. If I add a medium with pepperoni, then the total amount goes to uh, $19, and the bake time is still at 16 minutes, and so on. Okay, so essentially what this is doing is this creates an order object and it, uh, um, as we go through um, and add pizzas to it, it adds a pizza to the order um, and does the recalculations of those things. There probably should be a couple other buttons on here. There would be something like a finish order or complete order button where when I click that, um, it would uh, it would go in and somehow finalize the order, like maybe write it to uh, the pizza shop's orders of the day or something like that, or, or register it in 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 a in a daily log or, or something like that. All right, or write it to a database. Um, but again, um, I didn't add that. In addition, there should be a way to edit things once I put in this. Uh, to change anything, I have to go and press start order again. And that wipes out the old order and starts you with a new order. All right, so it wiped out the amounts. And I could go and add 
this Pete's on, and so on and so forth. All right. So let's go look at the coding. Is everyone clear on what this is doing, even if you're not sure on how the code works? Essentially, we have an order object. We create the order object based on our input from the GUI. Uh, we then go and create pieces for that. Again, not hard-coded as we did in the unit test, but based on the values from the GUI. All right, let's look at the code that does that. So let me go and edit pizza GUI. Really, this is the only, only class we need to look at, all right? Because all the other classes are the same classes that we've covered all along, all right? We are just putting a different front end on them. And ideally, you know, you could have written a GUI, and we should be able to take your GUI and apply it to these objects just as well. All right, there should be sort of independence between the, the way that the front end works and acts and the objects themselves. That, again, is a sign of sort of that they were designed correctly. If you can use the object from a variety of different GUIs, if things, there isn't any coupling between the GUI and the business logic code. That's a good thing. That's a positive. All right? So let's see what we have. We have a whole mess of things up here. We have a couple of J buttons. Start, um, BTN start, that's the start the order button, BTN add. We have a label for enter new name, which I did not see appearing, which we'll take a look at and see why we did not see that appearing. Um, I have a field for the name, a text field for the name. I have a checkbox for whether it's delivery or not, the order, excuse me. I have a checkbox that says whether the pizza is a sheet pizza or not. I have a checkbox that determines whether it is, uh, whether it has pepperoni or not. I then have a radio button group. Um, one for size, that's going to contain these radio buttons, and one for crust, that contains these radio buttons. A radio button group is what, the radio button is each individual button. The radio button group is what sort of binds them together and gets them to work like a radio button. So for example, notice that if I go in and enter an order, these three, or I'm sorry, these two work as a unit. So if I click on one, it unclicks the other one, unchecks the other one. And these three work as a unit. So these three radio buttons work as a unit, and these two radio buttons work as a unit. Um, so I can pick one of those two in the first radio button group, and I can pick one of those three in the second radio button group. It's a radio button group that makes them work as a group. All right? The buttons themselves are just radio buttons. Putting them in a group is what gives them that radio button, um, what would you say, functionality. So I have a radio button group for the size and a radio button group for the crust. I then have, again, three radio buttons for the size, two radio buttons for the crust. I then have a label for the cost, a label for the bake time. And then finally, I have three panels. We can almost guess what the three panels are. One is sort of the container that contains everything. So we have associated with uh, a, a, um, a, a J window, we have associated, or J frame, I'm sorry. We have associated with a J frame sort of a main panel. That's the guy that holds everything. We then have a separate panel for the order header stuff, and then we have a separate panel for the pizza detail. So as I type in an order, that shows the other panel. And I can go in and add stuff to that order. All right. 
Now, probably should have given them more meaningful names, right? P main, P order, P pizza, just to let me know that, all right? It's important to give meaningful names, because again, if I were to look at this probably Monday after Thanksgiving, I might not remember what P1, P2, and P3 are, but if I gave them meaningful names, I'd have a fighting chance. The other thing you can do, of course, is you can comment your code, all right? That actually is an excellent exercise to study this and see that you've learned it, is to go and download this and try to comment the code. Try to write the purpose of each instruction. All right? One thing about comments, um, I don't use them a lot in the examples, um, simply because you know I'm lecturing about it. It's hard to type the comments in as I'm typing the code and, and so on while I'm explaining it. I know those are just excuses. All right? I probably should. But a comment should describe not the mechanics of what the instruction does, but the purpose of the instruction. So this would not be a good comment here, even though you might think it's a good comment. Whoops. Create a J panel named P. All right. Why is that not a good comment? Well, of course that's what it does. That's simply explaining the syntax of Java. And the assumption would be anyone that would be looking at this, would be coding it, understands Java. And they don't need to understand the syntax of that statement. If they don't understand what that is, then they have some work to do before they can go and work on this program. All right, they need to understand the coding. Um, a better comment would be explain the purpose. Create the main panel that will be placed in the J frame. Create the panel for the order header info. Create the panel for the pizza detail. Ideally with this, there should be some sort of scroll control added to this so that as you're adding the pizzas, you could see them, see what the person ordered before. Again, we, we're not, I'm not claiming this to be a masterpiece. I just wanted to demonstrate some certain things with this. But again, when you comment, comment with the purpose as opposed to why you, why that statement is needed as opposed to describing what it does. All right. I then have an order object. I have a main order object called O. All right. My static main simply calls, excuse me, simply creates a new pizza GUI object, which will call the constructor, which will do all these things. That's sort of the standard MO of these GUI applications, is there'll be one thing that will be the main frame, all right? And it gets created when you um, execute the main, um, the main function, the static main method um, of the class. So let's see what we do. All right. I Set the default close to exit on close. We've seen that before, I think, in all the GUI examples, so that the application shuts down when I close this. When might you not want to do that? Well, what if this window popped up a secondary window? You wouldn't necessarily want to close the whole application when you close the secondary window. Um, I'm trying to think of an example. Uh, if you put the address in, there might be a selector for city, state, or zip. I guess you could use a drop down for that. Uh, maybe there's a, 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 a help that tells you what areas of the city that you deliver to. So you could click that and pop up a window that says, yeah, we delivered within this range. And you could go and look to see if the address was in that range or not. All right. You wouldn't want to necessarily close the whole app down when you close that secondary window. But for the main window, yeah, when you close it, that's it for the application. I defined a layout as being a new box layout with a um, along the y-axis. Y-axis, again, is vertical. Now, if you look at this, I should probably just keep it open. But 
it doesn't really look like It doesn't really look like it is vertical, but it is. When you consider that, this is panel one, this is panel two. So panel one and panel two are the two panels that are placed inside the main panel, and those are stacked vertically. All right. I have no layout in the other panels. Therefore, they, by default, are going to go horizontally. So all the stuff in panel one goes horizontally. All the stuff in panel two goes horizontally. But panel one gets stacked vertically on top of panel two simply because the main panel has the layout defined as going uh, vertically. If we were to go and add that, stack those vertically, then actually looks like this. Oh my. All right, and then we have these things going vertically. All right, so we add to our main panel P1 and P2. We then add to P1 the text name, the checkbox for delivery, and the button for to start the order. This is where, again, you could comment this code if you wanted to, but if you choose good variable names, it's probably less important. TXT name, oh, that's probably the text box for name. CHKDEL is probably a checkbox for something. Well, it's associated with the order delivery. And finally, BTN start is a button. I typically will. Um, oftentimes prefix my variable names with an indication of the type of the name. So uh, if I use a Boolean, you know, and I wanted to see if there's pepperoni or not, I might call the, the variable B has pepperoni. If it's an integer that is going to have uh, the number of pizzas that you want, I might call it I number. A checkbox CHK delivery and so on. If you do that, again, the whole reason for that, you don't have to do that, but it's a good idea uh, to do that because that will help you keep clear of where th what things are. All right. So we're adding that to the main panel. Why didn't the label appear? Well, I forgot to add the label to the panel. So I have that label name out there. It's sort of floating out in outer space, but it's on no panel, so I don't see it. So I'd have to do this to actually see it in one of my panels. So just because you create an input control doesn't mean it's going to be available anywhere. You have to put it on something that's going to be put in the main frame. So now if I do that, now we see enter name along that. I then go and add um, up to the button start. I then start to accumulate the pizza panel. So I add the checkbox for whether it's sheet pizza or not. I add the checkbox if it's pepperoni. I add the two radio buttons, two places. All right. And then I add these three radio buttons, three different places. 
I have to add them to the panel in order for them to show. All right. I also have to add them to the button group to get them to work like a button group. All right. Whereas if I click one thing, the others disappear. I would have liked to be able to do this. Simply say, add the button group to the panel, but you're not allowed to do that. You get a compile error. Tells you that you're not allowed to add a button group. Um, to a um, to a, uh, a container like that. So we have to do we have to add have to do this in two steps. Add the radio button to the button group, and then add the radio buttons to the panel. Same thing with this guy. We add the um, size buttons to the size radio button group, and then we add the buttons related to the size to the panel. We add the uh, button for add to this, and then we add our two labels, one for the cost and one for the bake time. We're going to ignore these things for a minute. I set P2 to be invisible at first, right? I don't allow them to start entering pizza until we've typed in the header part of the order, all right? We could design this UI a bunch of different ways, but this is the way I chose to do it. The reason I chose to do it is the order object doesn't get created until we click that start button, all right? So therefore, there's no place to put the pizzas until we have started the order. Um, so I hide the P2 panel. I set the frame main content pane to P. And remember, P contains panel 1 and panel 2. I set the size to a certain size. And then I set the, the uh, J frame to be visible. All right? So... When we run this, this is what we get initially. I forgot to save it, I guess. That's what we get, and we're ready to go. The second panel is invisible, and but the rest of the thing, um, the rest of the thing is set. All right, now let's look at these buttons. This is the way I like to do it. Remember, there are other ways to do this. All right, one way to do this is I could have made my, um, what I'm going to say, I could have made my uh, J frame class itself implement the action listener. That gets a little dicey. Uh, it isn't too bad, but keep in mind we have two buttons here. So our uh, uh, action, um, uh, action, um, what's the uh, thing called? Uh, action performed function would have to look and check to see which button actually got pressed. All right. I like to keep it simple. The other way we could do it is with what is called an anonymous class. In an anonymous class, we go in and we actually put all of the code for the class right here in the parentheses. I think that leads to very difficult uh, and complicated to read code. All right. If you're used to it, I suppose it's not that big of a idea, but uh, big of a deal. But um, I prefer not to do that. What I prefer to do is I create my listeners as inner classes inside. Well, that's the best place for an inner class, right? An inner class that is inside the main class for the GUI. Now, something to keep in mind. Throughout this course, we've been preaching um, the notion of having code that is reusable, having code that you can use in more than one place. 
all right? That is true in many, many, many occasions. That is not necessarily true in this case, though, with those listeners. Because the listeners are tied very specifically to a specific GUI, all right? Our pizza classes have nothing to do with any GUI, and that's a good thing. You should be able to write a GUI that looks completely different than my GUI and still plug those pizza classes in and get it to work without really doing much or anything to the pizza classes. All right? However, you're probably not going to be, be using my action listeners because my action listeners are written specifically for my GUI. So my action listeners know that this page or this, uh, this GUI has something called TXT name on it, C-H-K-D-E-L, and so on. This is very specific to the GUI that I'm writing the code for, so I don't really care if it's reusable or not. If I were to do a different GUI, then I would have to have a different action listener. So it's not like I could share this between a couple different GUIs. All right? So I don't really care about that here. So it's, not, it's OK that these aren't in their own Java file, in their own class. Now, what does it mean to make it an inner class? Well, it is literally within the curly brace that defines the start of the class. Up here is my pizza GUI, which extends JFrame. Down here at the very end is the, the ending curly bracket. These classes are defined completely within this class. All right? What does that mean? Well, it makes it hard to use this class outside of the pizza GUI class. But you know what? That's OK. Uh, it makes it harder. Uh, that, you probably could use it. I'm really not sure how to, but you probably could. But it makes it harder. And as I said before, that's OK, because this is tied very tightly to this specific GUI. We probably never would want to reuse this class anyhow. But it, it means something else. It means that this class has access to all the properties that exist that are defined on the main class, sort of the outer class. So I have an order cl object called O. And I have these different things, buttons, and labels, and text boxes, and check boxes, and so on. Because these are inner classes, I can access those. All right? So that's good news. Now, in this case, um, I have um, exceptions. Uh, I don't have a lot of exceptions, if you remember, when I did the pizza example, uh, the latest version of the pizza example. It had a couple of exceptions, though, all right? Um, but as a rule, I'm going to want to wrap my code that's going to create these objects and set these properties in a try-catch block, simply on the case that I don't create the pizza object or order object correctly. Now again, the pizza object, if you remember, expects the size to be S, M, or L. It expects the crust to be either the word thick or the word thin. Pepperoni is a Boolean, so that's either true or false. Uh, what's the other uh, property? Um, oh, whether it's delivery or not is also a Boolean. So I wrote or when I look at this code, I made sure that I'm giving the right values to that. But you still want those try catches in the main classes, just in case someone revises this GUI, someone writes a different GUI or whatever, all those rules take effect. In fact, if I was testing the exceptions with the GUI, that would be difficult to do, because my GUI is designed to not allow anything, S but, anything but an S, M, or L. All right? So therefore, um, you know, I couldn't test what happens if someone gives it an XL or if someone gives it the whole word large. That's really where the unit testing comes in handy because with the unit testing, you're hard coding it and you can code the creation of those attributes and, and um, setting the attributes and uh, calling the methods and creating the objects any way you want. So you could code goofy data in there just to see how your class responds to it. So. We're going to have this within a try-catch. Remember, we don't have any cases in here, but if it's a number, 
All right? A text box contains text, doesn't contain a number. All right? Therefore, you can't assume that someone's going to type in a number inside a text box. All right? So therefore, that would be another reason to have this in a try catch. So what am I doing here? I'm taking the data from the get text field, or, I'm, I'm, or rather, I'm the text name field. I'm calling get text to get the value inside there. And I am asking, is the delivery box checked? Because if the delivery box is checked, then I want to set delivery to true. So this check DEL is a Boolean, right? If we look at my order class, my order class expects one of its constructors has a string and a Boolean for delivery or not. So I'm at least giving it the right type of data in this case, because the text from a text field is going to be a string. And this is selected property from the checkbox is going to be a Boolean. So I know that that's the right data types for the name and for the uh, delivery. So I create a new object. I set the panel 2 visibility to true. And I blank out the cost and bake time labels. So I start. Every time I click start an order, I start with a brand new order. What happens after I enter the first order then? And I click start order again to enter a second order. What happens to that first object? O is now going to point to a new object. So what's going to be pointing to the old object? Nothing. O is the only order object we have in this example, in this GUI. So if O is pointing to another object than the original, then no one points to that original object. What happens to an object that no one points to? It becomes orphan, which really, uh, maybe for a minute period of time, but eventually it's going to get garbage collected. All right? Because if you have an object floating out there on a heap, on the heap, and there's no pointers to it, that object is lost to you anyhow. There's no way to refer to that. All right? So if nothing points to an object, it's gone. Um, it may take a small amount of time for garbage collection to do its thing and actually get rid of and, and reclaim the memory. But from your perspective, it's gone as soon as something else points to a different object, as soon as that object is not pointed away from. So literally, it's either garbage collected or about to be garbage collected. And what do I mean by garbage collected? I mean that the Java virtual machine reuse it. Let's, 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 um, um, deallocates that memory so that memory can be used for other stuff. All right? OK. Now I have an exception um, just in case uh, something went wrong here. I'm displaying uh, an exception. I probably should have separate error labels instead of reusing the cost and the bait time, especially since those are on the second panel and not the first panel. So that's what happens when I click the Start Order button. How do I know that? Because the Start Order button, I added an action listener of New Start Order. I can do that because new, the, the class Start Order implements the action listener interface, which means what? It means it will have this method in it, the action perform method. The action perform method translates to the code that runs when you click on that button. All right? And that's the code that runs. We create a new object. 
which effectively gets rid of everything in the old object. We make the second panel visible. Excuse me. And we initialize those labels. Now my other button, I have an add listener, uh, an add action listener of add order. And that one also implements action listener. What would happen if I got rid of this? And I said that I have add order, but I didn't say that it implements action listener. What do you think is going to happen? Probably something bad, right? We, we could guess that. I mean, I didn't type that in just for the heck of it, right? So I probably had to type it in. What do you think is going to give us an error? All right. That's, that's a possibility. That's fair. Something else it might not like. Might not like this. So let's see what, which of the two errors we get. Or maybe there's other possible errors. It doesn't like this line, line 67. Can you explain by layman's term, in layman's terms, if that even makes sense for these kinds of problems, why the compiler had a problem with that? Why did, I mean, it was OK a minute ago. I removed the fact that it implements the action listener, and now it has a problem with that line. It can find it. Let's, let's look at what the error says. Incompatible types. Pizza GUI add order cannot be converted to action listener. So it can find that add order. But what is no longer true about that? It no longer is considered to be a valid action listener. Remember, the whole idea of creating an interface is interfaces are created so you can plug anything that implements that interface to wherever one of those things is called for. So think of uh, a USB interface in hardware. What does that mean? That means anywhere that you have a USB port, you can plug it in. All right? You can plug it in. And in a perfect world, it would work. All right? What does it mean when you have an interface here? When you have an interface here, you can plug it in as long as it's the right kind of thing. So I couldn't plug in a USB into a FireWire port, all right, or into a VGA port or something like that. I can't, the only things I can plug into this statement are valid action listeners. What makes it a valid action listener? The fact that I have said it implements action listener. So I have to say, hey, I can use this guy wherever an action listener is, is called for. This can serve the role of an action listener. The way that you do that is by saying you implement that interface. Now, when I say that, I can plug that in and compile it, and it compiles cleanly because everything's OK. Hey, this function needs an action listener. And hey, add order is an action listener because it implements action listener. Now, someone mentioned about this function. This function you definitely need on an action listener. You can have it on other things. But having that function doesn't make it an action listener. Saying that it implements action listener is what makes it an action listener. What happens if we get rid of this function? Or even call it something else?
Let's make a goofy name there. What's going to happen there if I have that as a function name? Where am I going to get the compile error? I'm going to get the compile error on this line. I can't call something an action listener unless it has the method action performed in it. And so this will no longer have the method action performed in it, has some other method named, and therefore I'm going to get an error on that. It says, hey, it doesn't have the method action performed, and yet it claimed to be an action listener. So the bottom line is to make something an action listener, you need two things. You need to tell the world that this could serve in the role of an action listener. How do you do that? You do that by implementing the action listener interface. Now, if you're implementing the action listener interface, you have to have all the methods that exist in the action listener interface. There's only one of them, action performed. That, ex that accepts the action event argument. So you need this function in any candidate that you put the implement action listener in. Otherwise, it's not going to compile. Compile. Now let's see what we do. I create a pointer for pizzas. All right. I initialize some variable. If the button for small is selected, then I'm setting my size to S. Otherwise, I set this, if medium is selected, I set the size to medium. If large is selected, then I select the, the button for L. If thick is, is listed, then uh, selected, then I set the crust to thick. Otherwise, if thin is selected, I set the crust to thin. I then look to see if the, the checkbox for sheet pizza is required. And I made a mistake here. This should say new sheet pizza. Because if it's a new sheet pizza, I want to select it and give it. I want to I create a new uh, sheet pizza object, not a new pizza object. And I give it those arguments. Otherwise, I create a new pizza object. In either case, whether I've created a sheet pizza or not, it's still a pizza, right? A sheet pizza is a pizza based on the whole testing for inheritance and so on and so forth. And I take that pizza, whatever kind of pizza it is, and I add it to my order. I then ask my order to calculate the cost, calculate the bake time, and I display that in the level, uh, the, the labels. Now, a couple things. If I was, when I wrote the pizza and the sheet pizza class, I didn't write set methods, all right? Probably I was in a hurry. Um, I might have done it for pizza, but I don't think I did it for order. Uh, if I use set uh, methods, I might have gone about this a different way. All right, a little bit different way. But I was lazy and didn't go back and add them. So that might have helped me a little bit. Notice how there is almost no real code in here other than creating objects and setting some values, taking the values from the GUI and using them when I issue my constructors. And then I call some methods to get the results. So I create the pizza based on the values that uh, were in the, the GUI. I add that pizza to the order. Then I ask the pizza, hey, or I ask rather the order, hey, how much does the order cost? And what's the bake time? And then I display that. I then have, again, some exception processing because who knows what's in these things. I may think they're, they're correct, but I then have some error processing to look to see if any exceptions were generated, then I'm going to display the errors. Questions on any of this? So how is this different than the unit test? Well, the unit test, we can code whatever we want to in it. 
the GUI, the values that we get depend on the GUI. So in some respects, the unit test is even better for testing our classes initially, right? Because we can put any kind of garbage in the constructor. Here, we we're limited to what the GUI can generate. Um, here, we should test all possibilities again to see how everything works. Um, I know for sure there's one bug in this because what if I don't check any of these and I click add order. All right. Well, I got the invalid data because there was uh, um, problems with the, or there was exception checking on the small, medium, and large. There was not on the thick and thin. I do wonder where my other checkboxes went to. accidentally deleted them. I think when I was deleting those lines, I got a little delete happy. All right, there we go. All right, there we go. Um, so it does handle if the if the um, sheet pizza. Uh, I'm sorry, if the size is not checked. There is, there is validation for that. Uh, there should be validation also if the uh, crust is not checked. And I don't think I throw an exception for that. All right. Um, Wednesday. What I typically do on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving is I make that a work day for you to catch up on your stuff. So we're going to pick up with something new next Monday. Um, and uh, Wednesday will be just a day for you to work on any assignments that you have that are outstanding. All right, we'll see you up in lab.